name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen. Today on this fourth Sunday of Pascha, we commemorate and we remember the paralytic at the Pool of Bethesda. And the Pool of Bethesda, you can still see it in the city of Jerusalem. It's not too far from the home of Joachim and Anna. And if you imagine a pool, you would be wrong. So it is what I would call a reservoir. It no, no longer has water in it now. But at least by the time it was built up a few hundred years later in Byzantine times, it was probably 50 feet long, and we should say pools, because they were well over 100 feet long, hundreds of feet long. Think of reservoirs. Think, how do you have water on the top of a mountain like Jerusalem? And so these pools were actually reservoirs around the city where they brought water up into the pools so that they would have water. So this massive, small lake, you could imagine, had multitudes of people around it, waiting for the stirring of the waters. And the gospel uses that word, multitudes, these five porticos that are just filled with people who are blind, who are sick, who are lame, all kinds of diseases. And Jesus came to that multitude of the sick, and he came to just one. Now Christ could have said, arise all of you who are sick, I heal all of you. But he came to just one of this big multitude of people. This man who had been sick for 38 years, and he said those words, do you want to be healed? Asking him what his desire was, as though he didn't know his desire. It's, these are such profound words, and we learn three truths from these. Many truths, but at least three that I can come up with. The first is that we have the freedom to choose. Everything in our life is choice, is freedom. It's true that because of the nature of the fallen world, we are in slavery as well, so some of our decisions don't really feel like decisions. But from the perspective of God, there's always freedom. He will not be our dictator. He will not impose healing upon us. He will not force his will upon us. Rather, we have the freedom that he's given us so that we, in turn, can freely choose to turn to him, freely choose to love him. And then God responds. But sometimes, to be honest, we want a dictator. We want God. This is why people say, why is there evil in the world? If he's a good God, why is there evil in the world? What they're saying they don't realize is, I want a dictator God. I want a God who will impose upon us the things that we don't want. Because the harder reality is that we want the things in the world that are broken. We want the sin. The second truth that we see from this statement of God, do you want to be healed, is that God is able to heal. This may be more obvious. He's able to heal everything, everywhere, all things. He can change, transform, transfigure into a new creation. He can heal everything. Illness, struggle, sin, all of that can be overcome by God. So why doesn't he do these things? Why doesn't he heal everyone and everything? Because oftentimes, on the one hand, God uses our sinful actions toward our salvation. These are the tools or the building blocks, if you will, towards his goal of our salvation. He allows for us to do evil things and works through them. But on the other hand, we also want the sin. We want the evil. We want to do the things that we want in the terms that we want, in the way that we want. And so... God doesn't heal it because he allows us our freedom. If I don't actually be, want to be healed of my selfishness, God will allow that. He'll also allow me to then fall into sin with my own selfishness, 
And through that sinful condition, God will slowly work about my salvation, slowly wake me up from my selfishness so that I can then be healed. And this leads to the third truth from this, the paradox of our existence. Healing is available and we don't want it. That's the paradox of our existence. Healing is available and we don't want it. You see, we have the freedom to choose. There's a beautiful article that I put in the newsletter from Mother Silowana of Romania. This was translated by Ioan's father, our, our new youth director. She says, God's commandments are actually instructions for how to live a good life, instructions full of power. God is hidden in his commandments. This uncreated power, God's grace, is placed in his commandments that are uttered in human words to reach me. For example, if I tell you to go into the living room and turn on the light, you can say that this is a commandment and it restricts my freedom. But if you turn on the light, you will discover the object you were looking for or wanted is there. Without the gesture of turning on the light, you would not have been able to use what you needed. But we stop at this resistance we have against the commandments because through the fall from paradise, we desire to follow our own will. My brothers and sisters, we sit at the pool of Bethesda says multitudes because that includes each and every one of us sitting at the pool wounded sick broken sinful needing healing many times not even knowing what healing we need and many times not even wanting the healing that we need and we see the sick people all around us in humanity as well look around at the world around us all of these massive signs of people's brokenness, of their confusion about who they are, who they are in the world, who they are themselves, who they are in relation to God. We're all sick. And so our Lord every day comes to us, comes to us and asks us, do you want to be healed? But of course, God himself doesn't come to us. He speaks through us, through the people around us. If I want to sleep more, but I have to get up because a child is in need, do you want to be healed? If I get onto the road and it's all traffic down 217, do you want to be healed? If I go into my work and I get yelled at by a superior or someone else, do you want to be healed? Every single moment of our day, we have these moments in which God... What is he doing? He is revealing to us our own brokenness. If someone's yelling at me, I could say, well, they're yelling at me. I'm angry and I'm justified. Or I could say, I'm not in a state of peace anymore. This person is yelling at me. It reveals to me that my patience is lacking. I only have this much patience, and now I have a person yelling at me, and I have no more patience. And so therefore, I can see my own brokenness. I can see the way in which God can heal me. You see how artful he is? We have the eyes to see. We go around our daily lives, and all along our day, we're being asked, do you want to be healed? Because there's some sort of turmoil inside of me a turmoil of some sort of passion, whatever it may be, envy, lust, anger, whatever it is. Turmoil inside of me instead of peace. And so our Lord is saying to us, do you want to be healed? The paradox of our healing is that it's through pain that we are healed. It's through sickness that we are healed. That may sound, think about it a little bit. I'm not saying that we get healed from sickness. Yes, that's true. But it's through the sickness that we become healed. What do I mean by this? This is what so many of our saints talk about sickness and cancer is this great joy. It's a great joy that I'm sick. Why? Because now my soul can be healed through this physical ailment 
now the spiritual healing can occur. But instead, when I see my own brokenness, I blame others. I get angry. I don't like my condition. I want it to be done. I want it to be gone. I want God to take, get rid of it. But God loves us so much that he allows us to face these struggles, immense struggles at times, because it is through this that we are healed. There's a recent saint, Saint of Menios, who was the, the cell attendant and disciple of Saint Nikephorus the leper. You can look at Saint Nikephorus the leper's own life for the way in which sickness brings about sanctification. But Saint of Menios, someone shared this phrase with me recently. He said, Kalos ke o karkinos. Cancer is also good. Who of us thinks cancer is good? Who of us would desire to have cancer? And yet, through cancer, how many people receive their salvation? How many people are transformed through cancer? Saint Paisios, another recent saint, saw so many people come to him with cancer, and many of them he healed. And many to this day, through intercession to him, he heals them of cancer. But Saint Paisios, now this is hard to comprehend, he desired to have cancer because he saw the immense pain of these people and he wanted to experience it with them. And God granted him his wish. He had horribly painful cancer. And he said, all of the ascetic labors of my life, from when he was a little kid, he was up at night in vigils, to when he was on Mount Athos and he was the lowest of the low, doing multiple chores in the monasteries he was at, to when he was living on Mount Sinai, living in the desert like John Thymicus and all of the other great ascetics, to when he was back to Mount Athos and living on crusts of bread and nothing. All of my ascetic labors, he said, have done so little to my salvation compared to this cancer. That's what he said. And because through all of these painful experiences of cancer, he became such an immense dwelling place of God's grace, a vessel of God's grace. Last week, he heard from Father Gregory. So if you can imagine his voice for a little bit, I had him over for a meal later in the week. And he told me this experience of when he first met St. Paisios. Father Gregory was a young man from Korea, had been Orthodox, and wanted to go to Greece and experience orthodoxy there. And so he went and studied in Thessaloniki. And he heard about this very holy man, St. Paisios, of course, Elder Paisios at the time, who was outside of Thessaloniki. People talking about the miracles and all of these things that were happening. And he so he wanted to go see him. So he went to the monastery in Soroti. He's waiting in this big area. There are all these people waiting, a room maybe like this size waiting and waiting for their turn. And St. Paisios would come out of the room, maybe that far away, he said, and look for someone very intently and then bring them in. Then he comes out, and, and uh, Father Gregory had been waiting for quite a while, and he comes out, St. Paisios, maybe 50 feet away, he's looking around intently, looking around intently, and then his gaze fixed on Father Gregory. And he said, right at that moment, Father Gregory was filled, filled. With, imagine all of his excitement describing this, filled with joy and peace and calmness. He said he couldn't even describe or understand what occurred to him at that moment till years later. He actually had to read about someone else's miraculous experience of this and go, that's what it was. But just filled with such incredible joy and peace, everything perfect. And he had the thought in his head, I want to stay here. And that was a moment. And St. Paisios then went on to talk to someone else, bring someone else in. And he's waiting and waiting, slowly getting closer in the line. And then when he gets to the front of the line, and finally he gets to see St. Paisios, St. Paisios didn't say much to him. But St. Paisios looked up at him and he said, you can't stay here. He knew what was in his mind and his heart. 
But this kind of outpouring of grace, this is what God offers to us. And it's hard to imagine in our broken lives because we live these very normal lives where we don't experience that kind of grace. And it's true that we need to go to Greece or Russia or these other places to experience really holy people because there are very few in our lands. But God works through the people around us. We don't have to go to a saint to be healed. We just have the people right inside our house. The people in our neighborhood, the people in our work, the people on our streets, everywhere. God can work through them if we have the ears to hear him. If we have the ears to hear that he's saying, do you want to be healed? Stop the excuses. Stop the justifications. Stop allowing ourselves to participate in sin and passion and anger and all of these things. Just say, yes, God. I want to be healed. And then his grace comes upon us. We become sanctified vessels of God's grace. My brothers and sisters, do you want to be healed? Amen.